uh, Earl has, most of people know, knows him, uh, has received his B bachelor degree from the University of Rhode Island and his master from here, University of Colorado. He then uh, worked for Raytheon and for Conica and w came back to academia to finish or to do get his PhD working uh, with Professor Tom Cathy. After uh, that, uh, he started a company together with Cathy and Mer Mercure called CDM. He's the E in CDM. And that company was uh, merged uh, with Omnivision Technologies in 2004. And he's now uh, the responsible for new technologies in this new company. So welcome. Well, thank you, everyone. So I, I want to start out with a question first. Well, actually, a couple questions. So I feel free to talk at any time, ask questions, put your hand up, just shout it out. So who's ever crashed on a mountain bike? OK, I'm on that list too. That's why I got this. It looks way better than it did a week ago. And if this talk was a week or two from now, it probably you wouldn't even notice. But I had to start with that. So uh, I'm going to talk about a topic that I think is interesting because all you guys are probably going to learn something, except for maybe one guy. You see, you can't talk when I ask questions. <laughs> um, but for some reason, the, the, the world of cameras is almost a secret, except it's not trying to be a secret. Um, just people just jump out any number. How many cameras do you think were made last year in the world? Any number at all. I won't tell you if you're right. Billion. Anybody else? 100 million. 100 million? Yeah. 100 million? A billion? Five billion? Yeah, so we'll get to that, but we don't even know that. And turns out the world has made more cameras in the last 10 years than the world has ever made cameras. So there's an enormous amount going on. NASA's got a lot going on, but it's not like the world of cameras. It's amazing. Um, so, and there's part of the reason why, at least in America, these things seem like secrets because we don't really understand them. And I'll tell you why. Basically, we're not, we're not part of the market. We don't have people that are, you know, 700 per square mile. It's not America. That's probably a good thing, but in the world of understanding cameras, it's not necessarily a good thing. So we'll see about what, who buys cameras, why do they buy cameras, what do they need, what do they want. A lot of the ideas about how do you even sell these things in market came a long time ago. It's actually quite impressive. There's some really smart people who've been related to it. We'll go over that. Really, the idea of the cameras I'm going to eventually show you is about precision. That's the whole story. And precision is a really complex uh, topic. And it didn't start with us. It didn't start even five years ago. It started before most of you guys were born. But it's a really interesting story. And we built on that. And then I'm going to go into the exact what, are, what really are cameras today. But we, before the background, you wouldn't get it. It wouldn't make any sense. And then where are cameras going? So the very first camera. And, Later on, this will, you'll understand why I'm showing you this, is uh, the mainstream camera. There were cameras a long time before 1988, but George Eastman was the first one who made a mainstream camera. Pass this around. This is a, a little simple box camera. And it turns out that uh, Kodak was the, this, this camera itself technically was uh, sold about 1914, 1915. <coughs> That particular one, or the earlier versions were about three or four times that size. They don't have one of those. It started from 1901. Kodak wasn't a camera company. It was a film company. George Eastman learned how to make film. And it wasn't film that was on big glass plates where you had to basically have a PhD to know how to take pictures like you did before the uh, turn of the century. He learned how to do it on a roll. And then he had to learn how to sell it. So he needed a camera. That's a ridiculously common concept even today in cameras. You're not really a camera company or something else, and you slide into cameras. And uh, you'll we'll see a couple more examples. But, and, uh, but that is a very straightforward thing. We look at uh, 1988. That's when the first Podak uh, patent came from. Uh, and just like today, the first thing you have to have a good idea is you're, you try to get a patent. Kodak got theirs, or Eastman got theirs. And you see, even in 88, he had to have very special limitations in his very first claim. And if you look at these things enough, you realize, OK, that means he, 
he was not allowed to, to be more general because someone else basically claimed that. Earlier cameras didn't require removable shutters and detachable film holders. So the, the world was already strongly going with cameras, at least legally. Eastman showed up and he changed all that. And I think he was a marketing genius. We'll see, these are almost like we're, what we're exactly what we're doing today. But the first cameras cost about a dollar. <laughs> and the very first ad, this is from 1901, they're not advertising to white guys in suits. They're advertising to women. Women don't even hold jobs, let alone vote. So this is a large difference, but he's going, no, 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 I'm trying to sell it to everybody, and everybody doesn't mean white guys in suits. And today this camera cost, would cost about $25, but it was, um, it was called cheap enough, well, as cheap as you can make it. Um, and they were also really easy to use. They could be operated by a school boy or girl. Another really common concept today is it's huge. The camera was called a brownie, and those little things, little creatures, it's from an 1880 story uh, that everybody at the time would know, and a brownie, in today's word, would be an elf. These things you don't see, they come around at night and they do good things for you. That's the name of the camera. That's the very first mainstream camera. Amazingly impressive. Um, and a big topic that uh, Eastman demanded is you push the button, we do the rest. All of the complexity we'll take care of. Um, Personally, that's why we don't have um, depth of field knobs on lenses from a long time ago. That was way too much complexity. Everything is trying to remove complexity for the user. 1901, all of these are from 1901, by the way. And except there was one strange thing, and I never could quite understand how this was happened. Fitted with meniscus lenses. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> how could they use that? Today, this would be so crazy. You couldn't find the CEOs of supposed camera companies who could draw you a meniscus lens. No way. But maybe people had a little bit more interest in the background of cameras. So here's the first pocket camera. After we had a camera, then we tried to make it smaller. And this camera cost about $300. But now, by then, people knew how to work cameras, and they could handle the complexity of this kind of camera. But it fit in your pocket. And if you watch, uh, or if you read old books, or maybe you watch some old films, even in the 30s and 40s, these kind of cameras were popular because they were affordable. And the complexity of that meant that now, for 15, 20 years, people had the ability to see different cameras, and they learned how to get, be familiar with them, and they could take the complexity of focusing. The earlier one had no concept to focus. You just point it and push the button. So another big topic. And at $300, that wasn't a cheap camera, at least in today's dollars. But, they could have, but that was fine. And I don't know how many of you kind of work with old cameras, but the type of aberration, this, this is a picture taken with a 100-year-old camera. The type of aberrations that are in these cameras make them completely unique. You cannot buy a new camera today that gives you anything like this image quality. As one of my uh, lens designer friends from a company in Japan, Satoru, would say, if I designed a lens like this, I would get fired. But in many places, they like the, the gentle, soft, smooth field. In Japan, these kind of images are frequently taken because it reminds older people of the gentler, softer times. And a friend of mine uh, from Boulder County took this picture just about a month ago. And that's the kind of pictures these cameras would take. So it's not like they were that bad either. They weren't. But Kodak taught us low-cost cells in new markets. If, we, if people don't know, have any idea what the heck the darn thing is, you've got to make it cheap, as cheap as possible. Market to everyone. And it doesn't mean it's not the obvious people. Children and adults, of course, why shouldn't they have these things, especially if they're low cost and cheap? And then slowly add features and increase price. This is what Kodak taught us in general. And if we look, does this make sense? Nokia did, uh, well actually they do these studies all the time. Uh, on the list of all the things that people use Nokia devices, just read phones, um, that's good enough. One of the, the second thing after basically talking or sending text messages is using it to take pictures. Um, I use mine all the time to take pictures. Uh, maybe you guys do too. Um, it's a good use. But let's look where do they actually go. 
you. Now, this, these uh, nomenclatures are maybe a little challenging, but this yellow is um, camera phones. The vast majority of the world's phone, uh, cameras go in phones. And this, this dark blue down here, that's what, what I would think and most people would think of as cameras. Basically, it's a single thing that only does one, has one goal is to take a picture. Fit all the Nikon DSCs, all your really inexpensive Pentax, uh, up to Leicas and everything. Everything fits in here. And you see what that trend line looks like, right? It's, it's not doing much. And obviously, the yellow is drastically changing. All of the economy of scale is in camera phones. There's almost nothing going on. The market will exist for a long time, but whoever buys these is not driving the technology. It's, it's the people who buy these that are driving everything. And these others are too small to even bother with. Um, but so who's buying these things? Because it's clear they're in charge. And if we just look at developing countries and developed countries, by developed America, Europe, Japan, and developing is everybody else, shorthand is China and India, three quarters of the cameras go to developing countries. So guess what? They've never had a camera before. They've never had a phone before. They've never known anybody who had a camera or a phone before. So it's like George Eastman again. I just need to be cheap. I just need to be able to take a picture. After they get better with it, then we can do things. Because America is probably down right around here. It's way less than 10%. So there's nothing driving the economy of scale for what Americans might want. And put Europeans in that same boat. Interestingly enough, Japan, and to a smaller extent Korea, they have a special local market. You can get really artsy things that are, even to me, they sometimes look crazy. But because Japan has a large number of high quality optics companies, they basically experiment. And they'd be happy with making 100,000. 100,000 would be a huge amount. They'd have to make 10,000. And maybe they lose money, maybe they don't. But at least for the consumers, there's options that maybe it's just, it is completely tailored for them. And maybe the company's learning something at the same time. But for America, we don't really have camera companies in that sense, these high quality manufacturers. And so just nothing available. But this is a critical concept. Almost everything in technology and cameras is related to that. Three quarters of the cameras don't go to developed countries. Huge. Now, that probably wasn't a common concept, right? Might be hard to know. Let's look how they're growing. They're growing like crazy. <laughs> cameras, cameras themselves, this is actually CMOS sensors, but sensor plus a lens becomes a camera. Might grow 60%. And then uh, between now and 2012, it might double by 2014. We're about a billion, a little over a billion right now, billion point one, point two. These uh, yellow is CCD. We, we, can, we can discount them. Uh, we might have close to two billion, a little bit past two billion in five years. That's an amazing number of cameras. That's an amazing number of lenses. Because remember, who's, who's buying these? A lot of them are developing countries. Well, we wait four or five years. Well, geez, what? Now everybody knows somebody who has a phone. Everybody knows somebody who has a camera. And they're probably on their second or third camera. Because I can guarantee that my phone lasts about two years. It doesn't matter how much you spend. It could be a little or a lot. And it's the same thing in China and India. Their phone is going to die, too, for a lot of reasons. So they're already going to be on their second and third phone. It means it's going to change a lot. It's going to change what happens here. It's going to change the, com the complexity of things that you can get and change the features. Um, and at the same time, the money, many more smartphones are going to be showing up, like a BlackBerry, like an iPhone. iPhone's going to do amazing things for just imaging. People aren't going to believe what's going to happen out of that, I bet. But there's just a rapid, rapid change. That's really what that means. The numbers are big, hard to keep track of, but it's not even close to stable. It's, everything's on the razor's edge. Counting two billion things is challenging. Uh, let alone design, engineering, and fabrication. It's, it's a fantastically difficult problem. And it constantly changes because it has to be the lowest cost. <clears throat> um, a lot of the markets are like, I uh, can't think of a good analogy, but basically if you get the right cost and performance, you can sell more than you can imagine making. But if you're off by 10%, you don't sell any. Because these markets attract a lot of competitors as they should. It's the only way they can make it. And it turns out if where we're going to go, how we make cameras today is the only way to even double such a huge quantity of things in five years. 
if you can't do it the way Kodak, uh, the way you know, Kodak did, that was really slow and painful and took them many, many years to keep experimenting with the uh, different form factors as well as the, the manufacturing technologies behind it. It was a really big issue. So let's move on to now just precision, because trust me, the kind of things I'm going to show soon is all about precision. It's, um, it's actually an amazing topic. And precision in, America, precision in the world came from Polaroid. Polaroid started a large number of things. And we at CDMM have a, had, had a long relationship with Polaroid. And if I can do this, I think I have an engineering sample of camera. It doesn't have the normal things on it. But this is a camera that Polaroid under Edmund Land spent about a billion dollars to make. And it is fantastically complex. But it was in the 70s, it was okay. <laughs> Try that out. And um, it cost about a billion dollars, but it was made for 30 years. And they sold about a billion cameras. Edmund Land could do that. Almost no one else could. So they made a fantastic amount of money. But today people wouldn't, for half that, wouldn't attempt that camera. But fundamentally, um, came the 70s, Kodak had a lot, there was a lot of technological changes happening. Kodak couldn't keep up. And a company like Polaroid became the big player in the world with these types of cameras. And like Kodak, Polaroid wasn't a camera company. They were a film company. Many years prior, Land invented instant film. Instant, not in a digital way, but instant enough back then. And they needed a camera to sell it. And if you look at the layout of this camera, I mean, this makes anybody who actually has done optical design nervous. It should. There's nothing square to anything else. <laughs> Amazing. And it's the need for this camera that, that spawned the kind of cameras I'm going to show you soon. <clears throat> and um, fantastically complex and almost impossible. So this, this taking lens, aspheric molded plastic. In the late 60s, there was nothing called molded plastic, let alone aspheric molded plastic. This is the same time in history that people started to realize, hey, there's this thing called MTF. We can learn how lenses work in a different way than the image of a point or matching up with test plates. This is all happening at the same time. Aspheric glass, you can see this top viewfinder lens, from here I can see it's aspheric. The departure from a sphere is giant. Um, but this was the, the driver of all of these changes. So Kodak, or Polaroid rather, made about a billion of these, and they were before even had lens design software. So these guys started and they made every piece of the software, of the metrology, of the hardware to produce it, as well as all the design. And uh, a, an amazingly clever function that underground drove more of the technological changes was that the taking lens, uh, not in this one, but in a few generations later, in order to focus, it didn't have elements that moved in Z, that one rotated about the other on an on a axis that was far from the optical axis. And it's a kind of an amazingly difficult concept. I'll show you some pictures in a second. And if you want to read a complicated patent, one related to this is it. But it came from the origin of taking a plano, two plano cubics. And I'm not sure how many of you have ever seen this experiment, but you had two plano cubics. You kind of rotate one, um, complement to the other. If they're lined up, basically the effect is net zero. But if you slide one relative to the other in either direction, you'll get power, optical power, basically a second order term. And you could use that then to change focus on a one dimensional lens. To the extent you needed a one dimensional lens, that would work just fine. Of course, for Polaroid, they needed a two dimensional lens. So that wouldn't work, but that was the origin. So they made a ridiculously complicated second surface that fit in front of, of course, uh, wildly uh, rotationally aspheric first surface, and it would rotate, and that's how they would change focus. This was in the 60s. <laughs> All right. So today, the challenge of this is beyond imagination. And here they are made. After you design, let's presume that you already know how to oh, back up for a sec here. I'll recognize this is an eighth order polynomial of the 44 coefficients. And I, I'll tell you, I bet most lens designers don't make eighth order polynomial surfaces all that often, let alone 44 coefficients because it's not rotationally symmetric. This thing is complex. Here they are in, in real life. This is the thing that rotates on a crazy axis. This is the thing that, the aspheric thing that fits in front. This is just a regular lens. It's, it's part of the focusing. This thing at the bottom here is a big, thick, 
plane that its front surface has the same surface that this Quintic uses, just to kind of show the effect they were learning about the surface. You can see how wild looking it is. I mean, this, this thing, again, today, the making, the measuring, the designing, it's almost off the charts in the complexity. I, I think Kenny Kubala back there could, could nod in agreement. I mean, pe people would run from this thing, let alone that thing. It's, uh, and so then we have the aspheric glass viewfinder optics, which are almost trivial in comparison, because they're almost circular, not exactly, but they had to make those too. These were made actually in Japan, glass optics. But this thing drove all of the method to precision. So uh, Polaroid was structured with Bill Plummer uh, in charge of the, of the optical engineering department. They had a set of designers and they had uh, fabricators, um, physicists, people who made things and measured things and the people who designed things. The very first machine was Clyde. Clyde, again, was fundamental in understanding how to make uh, SX-70 and is very fundamental to the kind of things that we do today. Um, basically, this thing's job is to measure to a, a few microns of precision. This thing is a micron and a half. The optics that, that the Polaroid camera took uh, had needed uh, precision on the order of 10 to 15 microns. You divide by 10, what your metrology should be, it's on the order of one to two microns. Um, and interesting concept here, this thing is, uh, is a, basically a water bath that's suspending this column, so it's y-axis column, so it's floating, so it has very, very little force. It has a stylus and it's using to measure probably with micrograms of force over a small area, but with very fine precision, especially for 68. Keep in mind, they didn't have laptops, there was barely computers, there was definitely no spreadsheets, there was none of that stuff, so they had to invent their own computer, all of the hardware software, they had to make all the slides, they had to make everything. Absolutely everything. Well, I think the, the granite they bought from guys in New Hampshire. But other than that, it's custom. And this date is when it got perfected, but soon after you make the metrology, then you make the machine that makes. And this is a two action axis oh. ultra precision. Uh, in the world of fabrication, ultra precision implies sub-micron. Precision is past that, and so if you went to, um, say, a standard machine shop, they, they could usually make things in tens of, tens of thousands. Ten of th ten thousandth is about uh, 20 microns. So in this is orders of magnitude, it's crazy big, not, not relevant. Uh, but the first one was made around, started right after Clyde was made, called Bonnie, Don Combs, some of you might uh, have heard of him, very famous character. Um, but again, the same thing, make everything from scratch. Where do you get it? There's no prior art. You certainly can't buy this stuff. You could barely buy this stuff today. Following along is a three-axis profilometer, Huey, and uh, basically you can make more and more modern things. This was a sub Mic, um, sub-micron um, metrology at that point. And this is John Mater, uh, another one of the handful of Polaroid people that uh, did all this work. Uh, the last couple of incentives are destroyed just because, uh, well, we'll get to that, but Polaroid was no more. A couple of companies came in and they kind of experimented with them, but fundamentally these things are all custom, and so there's no way to know how to use them. And there's not much interest either because they're not easy. The user interface is crappy. That's all it took. And here's Louie. This was the last in their series. This is basically it's ultra precision turning and grinding. Uh, there's a lot related to this, but just to say that you know, this, the, the scale of the understanding and the learning to be able to make that camera uh, got them to be able to measure and make wild surfaces to under a micron precision very, very well. And I know that if you want to learn how to do this, you don't go to any school in Colorado. I don't think you go to any school uh, west of the Mississippi or east of the Mississippi. There is no place to go. So the way to learn is from these people. It's, it's on the edge of lost art. But from this, uh, generated all of the high-end machine tool companies in America, basically machine tool companies, people who make uh, diamond bits and special grinding wheels, things that cut or grind. The big, now you can buy things like this for money, if you know what you're buying. Uh, they are a thing called uh, Numo, which had a long path to became Presatech, and a company called Moore. If anybody knows anything about what I'm talking about, these are the companies in the world. There's very few, because guess what? How do you learn, right? There's no way to learn. So, um, and but they all came from Polaroid. The legacy is unbelievable. Um, and in addition, these people are still around. Uh, Bill Plummer, I'm trying to talk 
uh, Ariel into getting Bill Plummer to come give a talk. He's one of the most fantastic speakers in history. He got hired by Edmund Land himself to be his assistant for five years. Just that alone. Maybe you can talk about other things. But Don Combs and Bill Plummer, they work with us. Uh, basically because the new owners had no idea how to run it. And so they decided they wanted to ship it somewhere, but this thing weighs like 10 tons. It's a crazy heavy. And so you ship it somewhere, and then what? And it's all with, this actually has modern computers. The other ones had really old PDP-11s that were, they were upgrade every decade. Um, but there's no user manual, there's no tech service technician, there is no standardization of any kind, because those guys, they were fired. <laughs> they work for us. <laughs> and we actually tried to buy these things, but you know, you'll see in just a couple slides that the people who are related to camera companies don't know anything about cameras. They certainly know anything about light. And this is just heavy stuff. That's what it translates to you know, after Polaroid stopped. Heavy stuff. I don't want heavy stuff, get rid of it. And now you can kind of buy this. But you can buy it in the way that you can buy, say, cooking tools for your kitchen and become Julia Child. Mm, you have this big step in the middle. Now, you can't even buy a knife that's sharp. You think you can, but you can't. It's kind of like this, this whole industry. You can buy things, but unless you know how to use them and put them together, because nothing's ready to go. Nothing's play, plug and play. And that's a big hole. And you know, there's, I, I see no place of where people are trying to change that. But Polaroid had an amazingly interesting ending, uh, at least the company. In 2005, this guy Tom Petters, I don't know if any of you guys ever heard of him, but he was part of this group that uh, basically buy companies that are hurting and change them, make a good amount of money. Tom had an interesting life. Basically, he's one of these guys that had uh, you know, one semester of college and he figured out that's probably enough. And um, he started off doing things, and he looked like he was so darn um, successful. Until, like, in 2008, he was arrested at gunpoint because he was running a Ponzi scheme. Like, wow, I, I can't believe it. It's so shocking, <laughs> right? And but he was doing it since 95. Wow, geez, he bought Polaroid in 2005. So you do the math, you figure, I bet that wasn't legal. Yep, so all that money he used to buy Polaroid was somebody else's money. And guess what? That was quickly ended Polaroid. The amazing story, and this guy, I think, is, he kind of led the way to people who think they're in charge of camera companies but don't know anything about cameras. It's an amazingly popular concept today. And people who work with cameras that don't know about light is the second most popular concept. So all of you guys could do a lot better job working in a camera company. But this is all, this is all true, it's amazing. And, and then, right around the same time, there's a lot of people who are basically artists, and artists really liked the human scale of Polaroid film. It wasn't instant, it wasn't nanoseconds uh, or microseconds, right? It took, I don't know, a minute. And uh, so a handful of people got a small amount of money, it didn't take much then, and in, in uh, memory of land, they decided to make this thing called the Impossible Project. They bought a factory in Holland that had made about a billion and a half instant film packs. That's what Polaroid was, was a film company, not a camera company. And they're, now they're trying to replicate the whole thing. But guess what? A lot of the supporting infrastructure, the parts of that factory had, were gone. Because that was just that weight idea again, right? It had no value to anybody. Who's going to ever want this? But these guys bought it for a very small amount of money. And they think in a year or two, they might be able to remake these again. I've got a number of friend, friends who are professional photographers. And they are definitely lining up to buy this stuff because it has special characteristics, super artsy characteristics. But you can't get any other way. And if you want that, that's how you do it. That's the end of Polaroid, besides the people and that big legacy. So let's go to what cameras are today. So um, since 2002, this is uh, an Omnivision look at cameras. Uh, basically, they get smaller and a little, I don't know, different looking as time goes on. The volume is going down at something like 40% per year. Volume is related to cost, but it's not cost. The cost actually goes down at about 20% per year. This is uh, a ridiculously accurate statistic. And about uh, 2006 or so, we had the concept of reflowable. Reflowable in a camera means that it uh, acts like any other 
uh, circuit or, uh, surface mount device where you just place it on a board that has uh, solder paste on both sides, you heat it up, and it attaches. There's no special step. It's how everything else in consumer electronics or large volume electronics gets made. Now, the cameras are like that, too. In theory, this should be a lot cheaper. But the camera, everything about the camera, lenses, the housing, the coatings, the sensor, they all have to survive 260C. Big problem. These would, would melt long before that. These guys don't. And uh, I've lost these things in the, the other room we have. But now it's in a bag. And I'm going to show you this. It's this little, one of these little cameras here. And wherever the, the box camera went, the specs for the box camera and this camera, even though they're 100 years apart, are really, really similar. There's a couple of decimal points in the sizes. But they're, they're for that market that people who never had cameras before. It's really inexpensive. You push the button, we do the rest. It's as cheap as you can possibly make it, because I kind of can't tell the issues, right? You know, how good does it have to be? That cost quality, it's cost, cost, cost. Give me some quality. But oh, let's go back to cost, cost, cost. But um, the pixel resolution is very similar to that big box camera. And in today's terms, or sorry, if I went back to Kodak's 1901 terms, that's about four cents. So made a lot of progress. I mean, they are cheap. It took a few billion dollars to make that, but they are cheap. Go ahead. Surprise PGA. Why is it not, you know, the insane number of megapixels? Who buys cameras? Okay, so in the developing market, PGA is. Right. Okay. That's it. Right? And you just need good enough. And it turns out, we'll see this coming, the, most of the cameras that are going to be used to get to 2 billion, 3 billion a year are going to be in systems. So they'll do things. They won't be necessarily consumer taking pictures. This is definitely for consumer taking a picture. Um, but it turns out the VGA can make a half decent picture. And it is kind of a sweet spot for a lot of things, certainly in terms of cost. Anything bigger is more expensive. First three items are cost, cost, cost. Sell it to everybody and his brother, as we know, right? You see ads, you, you sell it to, oh. to, to, to kids. You, you can't buy a phone without a camera, even in America. And a lot of places in Europe and certainly in Japan, a lot of the phones will have two cameras. Uh, I think Apple is going to be the first to have more than two, but that's just my idea. But uh, that's a separate story. But these things are they're minute. And when you see this thing goes, going around, just don't open it. It's ridiculously hard to find. <laughs> and this, like that one has no value, but just you know, hanging on to it is the hard part. <laughs> but amazingly similar to the big one. So you know, a, a big concept of why they started, besides keeping up to this 20% um, decrease in cost, is it can just be surface mounted. That can, that can save a large fraction of the dollar, <coughs> huge fraction. It can also be mounted on a flex, and there's a lot of details about this. Who's, what's the supply chain? What's the customers that are going to buy it and use it? Where are what's the countries of origin? A lot of details. But fundamentally, these cameras allow all that. So it's the kind of one size fits all. It's going back to that big graph where the vast majority are camera phones, and that little volume is everything else. And it's getting an economy of scale out of the big, uh, the, the big market, which is the phones. Now, the whole issue that allowed those little tiny cameras is the precision. And you see, when we went from here, they kind of, all of a sudden, they started to look a lot different. Even though those things are refoldable, they look drastically different. It's because we're able to get to some precision levels. This is a, a, a relatively famous figure that came from the folks at Philips, high-tech plastics. Turns out they're not around anymore. But if you, if you kind of keep going, this thing going back for, uh, backwards, and he went maybe back to the Polaroid years of, you know, 70s. They're way back here. And yet they're right about 10 micron of precision. So Polaroid was so far ahead of their time, it's not even funny. But right now, we're right around the 1, 2 micron area of precision needed in order to make these kind of cameras. This is there's an enormous amount of uh, assumptions to make this graph. But if a lot of people don't really follow cameras and technology related to it in the industry, this kind of thing goes a long way. <laughs> It's, uh, it's strange but true. So um, need to be able to get precision that's a few microns, one to two. And the better we can do it, the better the camera's going to be, either higher quality or lower cost. And this is an example of what that thing looks like just as a simple schematic. And this is what it replaced. And if, we're t if the whole issue is precision, look how many things have to stack up. Forget how much they cost for a second, but this thing, it has threads. It fits on something else that has threads. It's got something at lenses that are being held in this barrel. 
and I'm going to try to keep a micron or two microns through all that, so it's almost impossible. And then I'm gluing that onto this, this plate, which then holds the sensor, and I've got this tolerance stack up. It, I'm not going to get there from here. It's a horribly complicated problem. Um, so if you know anything about it, just say, oh, look, I've got two things. I've, here I've got five or six things, and here I can get a thread. And this is definitely one of the first things that manufacturers worked on uh, early years was threads, but still it's not something, if, you're, if your ruler is nanometers, because you want micron precision, you're not going to get there like this. And I'm not sure how many people are familiar with injection molding, but certainly can't do both. You can get really high precision and lowest costs. You can't do them both at the same time. Um, Polaroid made hundreds of millions of, of lenses that are extremely high precision but the cost was high. That, that camera was eight, $900. It was very, very expensive, right? It wasn't, because a lot of people knew about cameras at that point. They sold a billion, but to a pretty sophisticated market. Um, it, it turns out that even if you'd make this, this is a, basically these are big plates that come together in a mold base. They've got these pins that actually aren't in there. They, they kind of line it up. That's what these guys are doing on the side. They just make sure it gets in the right place. There's many tons of clamping force and then molten plastic is shot in here in a couple different directions and it makes this lens. Even if you make that perfect, you need to mate it up with presumably another lens or the housing or the sensor. And there goes all your precision. <coughs> so this could be at optical precision and maybe your other parts can be at optical precision. You put them together, you've lost your optical precision. Now you've got mechanical precision. And usually the finest, I mean the units are even drastically different. A, a fine precision in mechanics is at a, a thousand, one ten thousandth which is an order of magnitude away from the optics. Like the, the scale doesn't even work. So that isn't going to get there. <clears throat> so uh, there's many, many ways of making it to get to this ultra precision, but I'm just going to show one way. It, it, it illustrates the point. So we went back. Polaroid knew how to make very sophisticated machines that can make very sophisticated optics. You follow that same idea, instead of making uh, an insert um, basically, this, this thing here is called an insert. The thing that has the shape, this metal that would make it one half and then the other. Instead of making a, one insert that had ridiculous precision, because with a machine tool, you can, you, you can specify almost, uh, you know, if you want 30 nanometers, 50 nanometers, fine, you can do that. What, what would it take to expand that? So now, in my, the definition of my optic is now maybe 4,000 of those things, essentially identical. This, this one has some kind of a special pattern. There's some kind of experiment going on. I don't know what it is. It's, so this figure came from some guys in Denmark. But that's kind of the idea. Instead of making one thing at a time, how if I made thousands of things? So now you could guarantee that the distance between you know, one of these and one of these is accurate to tens of nanometers. As soon as you can make that step, as soon as you can do this, it's much easier to say than it is to do. There's nobody teaching anymore, right? There's no handbook, there's no prior art. People even patent this stuff, right? Whew, it's a huge secret. But if you had that, now you have the origins and you're not too far from how silicon's made, right? So silicon is the most precise, but silicon is made in steppers that have essentially no force. It goes to some place and photons come through. You know, I mean, there's a little bit of force, but not much. Here, you're actually scraping things, you're rubbing against things, and there's, a, there's sometimes a lot of force, at least relative to the stepper problem. So you, if you, it's, a, it's a different problem than, than the lithographic problem, but the goal is to be at that order of magnitude of precision. This is, this is part of it. So as soon as you knew how to do that, and then you take a big step, and you make some, uh, you replicate it, big word called replication, and then you, you basically get lenses that are on some kind of a substrate. Here's another close-up view. This can look like anything, but this is just a, a series of, and now in this case, might be Plano somethings. And that's the origin. If I, if we, now, if we had mo many sets of these, and I knew how to align them, because it's guaranteed that this one and this one, I know their precision and their location, then I should be able to build up thousands and thousands of cameras at one time. So the act of making one is the same as the act of making 4,000. That's exactly what happens. So here's a, here's a picture of just one after it's been cut out. But if imagine you made four steps. First you'd make uh, uh, you know, basically this top lens, and the second lens, third lens, fourth lens, and you, uh, in very relatively sophisticated machines where you're trying to align them and bond them, and these eight, 12, whatever size you're working on, then you can keep 
all of the optical precision in your complete assembly. This, the spacer is, is, a, is a little bit of a detail, but you have to trust me that you can do that at the same precision too. It turns out there's no X, Y precision, it's just a Z. And if I could get this thing, in, basically it's a, a big sheet with holes in it. If I can get these, the sheet uh, flat relative to the optical precision, but of course we can buy flats, right? That's my only criteria, and I don't have to see through it, so it could be anything. So you trust me, I can, you can do that. That's not so hard. It's making these and making and registering these, and then placing them on some kind of a sensor, and then dicing it up. What's the bonding process? Uh, there's a multitude of ways, but it's usually a UV curing epoxies, or, or there's also thermal epoxies. The, the main issue is that uh, it withstands the, the high temperature. Actually, all of it. So all of these things then can stand 260 degrees C for forget what it is, um, less than a minute, but it's a pretty high temperature. And, but through this, you can fundamentally get tremendous precision. And precision is gonna translate, well today it translates to amazingly low cost. But just like uh, 70s with cars, as soon as cars knew how to get precision, you could make really high quality cars. Basically you don't have to break in cars anymore. Maybe most of you guys don't even know that, but you used to have to break in cars. Now that, that's, nobody even thinks of this. So you can make extremely, you can make diffraction limited optics for imaging systems that, uh, that are very sophisticated, that don't have to necessarily cost anymore. Right? The method's more or less the same, but I'm just gonna use precision in a different way. This is a revolution in how imaging systems are made and quietly about how they're designed. The hard part is the making, you can design a lot of things, but it directly built on very large, be able to make very precise things in some sort of substrate. Um, so it's uh, dramatic. This is the step of replication in quotes. There's lots of ways to do it. The actual replication, people have been replicating microstructures for a long, long time. There's a lot, lot to it and there's lots of variations as almost anything. But uh, here's just one simple method uh, to do in the way on the right. So you have some kind of a backer, maybe it's called if it's translucent because maybe you want to put UV light through it later. This PDMS, PDMS is uh, like a silicone. So it's kind of, uh, it's soft, but it kind of holds its shape. You put some epoxy on it, you, you bring down on say this wafer, it could be this substrate, maybe it's just a glass, uh, thin glass. You bring it down and if you're good, if you can, all, everything's really flat and you can hold a uh, big area with even pressure uh, and no bubbles, no, no air anywhere throughout this very carefully and control shrinkage and many other things and you can pull it off and you can get a large number of very accurate lenses. When these are small, again, microstructures have been replicated for a really long time, that's pretty accurate, but when you're trying to get things that are big, say on the big, in this case, maybe a millimeter, millimeter and a half, it's a, it's a hard problem. But that's what people have been doing. Because of that, again, that billion cameras, there's a lot of demand. Um, and but it works reasonably well. You can get pretty good things. And this is the kind of ideas that led to that little tiny camera. So where are our cameras going? One of the most amazing things is that cameras decrease in cost 20% per year. And this is followed for such a long time. Everyone counts on this. Except for the manufacturer, he always thinks it's going to slow down, but it doesn't. It keeps going. Um, but if you look at, say, that, that little camera, wherever it went to, I'm hoping to get it back, by the way, eventually. Um, so take that, so that thing was just roughly a dollar if you buy enough of them. So in three years, it's going to cost 50 cents. Three more years, it's going to cost a quarter. And there'll be other changes, so it'll probably cost more if you want to vary some, or cost less if you want to get some other characteristics, or it could cost more. But uh, it's saying that you're probably going to need some more improvements over time. Like, if it's not mature, what could these things be? But then if you look at, uh, here's a, like a histogram of patents. I kind of like this graph, this type of graph. If you look at a technology area, and it's, not, it's non-trivial to, to group all of the patents in a certain area, but with special IP tools, you can do this with not too much trouble. Uh, and they, they group this. This is, a, this is CMOS image sensors, CIS. See, there was a big, you know, histogram and it falls off and actually we're off the scale, I think. Uh, so we're somewhere back here. It's like, oh, that's a bad sign. Hmm, things aren't changing much, huh? So as soon as this big revolution comes, it's gonna slow down. At least that's what this would suggest. So right, it's, a, it's a little dicey, I'm not sure where it's gonna go. But, but one thing we know for sure, in order to make these things cheaper, and again, there's a near infinite demand, that pixels are gonna get smaller. 
Uh, today, state-of-the-art and mainstream things is about 1.75 microns. 1.1 micron is uh, in experiments all over the world, and you know that's only a little bit bigger than a wavelength of light. And of course, people are thinking 0.9. And again, go back to you don't really know the guys who design pixels. They do know light, no question about that. But uh, there's going to be lots of pressure, and this is basically Moore's law in action. Uh, you don't want to stop Moore's law. You don't want to be the one responsible for stopping Moore's law. That won't work. Um, but here's, here's an example of something that maybe brings that a little bit more hope. So this is, uh, this is FSI, front side illumination. It's kind of a funny word, but a typical pixel has got multiple layers and a sensor, a diode on the bottom, and basically micro lens, but the light coming in, and it's like a little narrow straw. Imagine that this is one, basically a two wavelengths wide. It's going to be like 20 wavelengths tall. I don't really want to get light through that. I don't expect it to work real well. And guess what? It doesn't. Uh, a fairly simple concept, anyway, is once you flip it upside down. So take this end, grind off all of this to a, you know, a small, small fraction of a micron, and then let light come that way. Don't let light come from the other side. That has hope of making ridiculously tiny pixels become a reality. This other one, it can't, but this has hope. Basically, light has so little room to travel. It's a, you know, a fraction of a micron tall and a fraction of a micron wide. I like those odds better. I don't like the 20 tall and one wide. It turns out if you do that, you can get a higher sensitivity. Everybody wants higher sensitivity. They want lower cost and higher sensitivity. It doesn't matter what your application is. Um, it's just because you're re changing the physics of the problem. Is that partly because of the extremely small aperture? Yeah. Yep. That's because really funny electromagnetics that are happening. Because these, these things aren't really even straws. There's complicated three-dimensional structures. Uh, it's easy to draw them like, like this, but that's not really what they look like. It's, it's, it's a hodgepodge, and it depends on different pixels and everything. It's, it's messy. Um, but so just the physics of the problem is better. It turns out pictures look better, no surprise. And a really tough thing is making sure the colors stay consistent as the type of light changes. I don't particularly, sometimes you don't want this to happen. Like you're in the, in the mountains and their aspens are all yellow and I really want to keep that color. But it uh, turns out it's because of a different crosstalk and how pixels want to share uh, light from neighboring pixels. Uh, and if you get the sensor as close up to the top as possible, uh, maybe it goes away. Part of that is making smaller, you make faster lenses, bigger angles. Uh, thinner, basically make, bring the lenses even closer. Some of these cameras now are, are a small number of millimeters tall, and zoom lenses. Zoom lenses, now that would be a big concept, wouldn't it? If we could have those little tiny cameras that had zoom lenses, and they're coming, but nobody knows how to do it yet. Well, nobody knows how to do it in production. You know how to do one, ten, a thousand, ten thousand, maybe even ten million, but that's not much. If you can only make ten million, it's not very interesting. It has to be enabled by huge quantities. But it's things like this that'll probably go, that'll probably make this happen. Again, keep in mind that uh, in the next three, four, five years, the, a lot of the customers now who have bought, have had to buy the cheapest thing because they had no reference, will be out of that. There's lots of applications, some are really obvious. Automobiles are going to start using lots and lots of cameras. And actually, this is like a five, seven year cycle to get cameras in there, and it's already been going on. You might not recognize it, but there's probably at least one camera already well, if you buy a high-end car, you, you would recognize it because it'd be backup cameras. They're pretty common, but there's lots of places they want to have cameras, and the cameras would do tasks. They do jobs. Um, and given that cameras in cars have to last a decade or more, they, you can get a good money, amount of money for it. Um, this is a lot of people, especially from folks at Kodak, are thinking, well, what cameras should do now? It's not just single pictures. We should take video. Everybody should take video. Galore. It doesn't much matter to the camera. These cameras can all go at video rates, um, but the more people can, can find killer uses, maybe that would drastically change. And of course, if you look at statistics, it, statistically, the vast majority of us capture images. And no surprise, if you're younger, you're going to capture more, capture videos. And there's only like 20% uh, of the people who have never captured, um, well, if you're less than 18, if you're you know, a little bit older, maybe more. I'm not sure I fit somewhere in the round here, but I, and I don't take that many videos, but still, this is the guys you sell to right here. <laughs> the rest of us, uh, we don't, American, over 30, whatever. Doesn't matter. 
This is the guys. And so, and what do you do with them, right? That's always changing, always. So they're going to be enabled with, you know, that's the YouTube thing and everything else. Big deal. I don't know if you've heard about this poorly called 3D imaging. Uh, if you listen or uh, listen to details about uh, people in the camera business, they'll talk about this. A lot of it is stemming from Sony bringing out a 3D display. Basically, you wear special glasses, and all of a sudden, you, your left eye gets a different image than your right eye. Can't believe they're trying to do that. I'm not a big fan of that, but there are a lot of things that are gearing towards that. So it's like if you had a camera, if you had a television that actually in what uh, the end of next year, Sony's promising that these things will be available. A lot of people want to make sure that your phone can do that. Take a left and a right image. It's like technically not that complex, but hey, one phone can sell twice as many cameras. Okay, what else could you do with them? Uh, crazy things here where people are saying immersive displays. You walk up to an ad, and guess what? Your picture is in the ad. This is, seems like right out of Japan. This, this will take off. This will be huge. You know, in, in Boulder, Colorado, I don't know. And in, in, say, in big cities, maybe like you walk up to some shop in L.A., and there's a, there's a monitor behind like the, the big window of the shop, or like uh, the, the plate glass window from the street. You just kind of like move towards it, and this thing will see your fingers. It'll start to move. There's lots and lots of 3D. What they, they, the industry calls 3D. Yeah, it's poor representation, I think, but whatever. Um, many of those kind of applications, because now uh, those kind of cameras, they're essentially free. And you can get them in as big a quantity as you want. And how can you use them? Can you, how can you use them just to make money, basically? So fundamentally. Um, kind of tried to give you a, a sense of this crazy world of high volume uh, mainstream cameras. The, the quality and the power is, is surprising given their size and, and where they've come from, but they're low cost and always decreasing. It's the bane and the blessing of that whole industry. And if it stops, a lot of other things are gonna stop. So there's a, it probably won't happen anytime soon. Many things can take use of this and it's really systems uh, and I'm sure all of you guys can think of your other reasons and applications of where you would use a handful of, of cameras in cool applications. Oh, a fun fact, if you took that camera that came around and say you gathered up a million of them and you, and you were very careful and you arranged them in a block, it'd be like eight inches on a side. Eight by eight by eight inches. That's a million of those cameras. It weighs like 70 pounds. So, a lot of people are working overtime to try to learn how to use those cameras, but they will come and they'll surprise a lot of us. So that's my talk. I um, hope you liked it. We have time for questions. Yeah. Um, so is there any place in the world where the manufacturing is uh, uh, concentrated? Taiwan and China. Uh, different, different degrees. So they do the design there too? Uh, for some things, they probably do more of it. Um, traditionally, a lot of the design is done in America, but right. sometimes the design, for like that, set, that simple camera I showed, that little tiny one, it mm -hmm. doesn't have to be designed in America. When it gets to be a high-end, complex system, then there's probably people who would specialize and probably wouldn't be in uh, Taiwan, say in China. So. Like today, in America, right, being a designer is usually called a great thing. It's usually really hard. And there's not that many people who specialize in fabricating and, and, and making things. And in Taiwan, it's completely reversed. So you have almost no status if you design something. You're the one who really knows how to make things. You have huge status. And that's just their culture. And it works for them. Obviously, ours is a little different. F2.8. Yeah, I mean, it's just as fast as you know, any camera you're expecting. It could be faster, but the market wants that. <laughs> so it's, uh, I mean, it takes reasonably good pictures, being that small. It, it, it's deceiving uh, because the size doesn't change its quality. Is that so later? What about, I mean, you, you sort of went over lenses or anything that, that you'd expect different in lenses, um, saying we can just do whatever we want. Um, well, the, the art really is in the, in the making right now, not in the design. 
And what, basically what the people want, what the world wants, is the ability to get dynamic systems like Zoom, like something else. And dynamic in a small form factor is really painful. And so the world doesn't know how to do that. Of course, there's lots of potential paths. And uh, the, the market will open up and swallow anyone who's able to do that. Um, but again, the, the form factor is fantastically small. But that, that's, Zoom would, is great if people could do it. Dan? Speaking of the form factor, so how much um, uh, real estate does the supporting electronics, you need power supplies, you need to connect for these cameras? Is that, um, so if you were making denser radiance, you cameras, is that the limit? So, um, no, I mean, so if you look on the back of that camera, I, I actually don't remember how many balls it is, but say it made it 25% um, of that area that's on the road, and it'll happen. So like maybe, I think that camera's two and a half by two and a half by 2.9 millimeters. There's gonna be a sub-millimeter camera soon, less than a year. And at some point, uh, if you use the standard um, uh, ball grid array, there's just no room for the ball. So they're gonna have smaller balls and there'll be smarter signaling systems. If you have like only two and you're probably fine. It'd basically be serial, everything will be serial communications. They might even be wireless, so you forget the wires all together. Um, actually, that integration is going to be that integration in systems is going to be the bigger story outside of that. So, how do you get power to it? How do you get the images from it? Do I just want images? Do I want something special? Just don't keep giving me images because I'm going to do something with them, and they'll be smarter and smarter with this ability to be wireless. And I, I have a strong feeling, within five years, we'll have things that are totally autonomous. Where you just kind of put it up here. You never need to do anything to it except you can talk to it with your computer whenever you want to. I mean, that'd be a security applications, but that's what's going to happen. So it gets its own power from the ether. It'll talk to you on some version of the uh, of wireless. There's a, a huge need for things like that in a, in a big system concept. So if you had a million, say you're selling cameras by the foot. Say they're in the wall for whatever reason. How do you talk to them? How do you power them up? They might, only a third of them might work. That's fine. You got a million right there. <laughs> but how do you connect to them? And that's where they have to, and they'll be on the ubiquitous networks. Dust networks is like this. So there'll be a little tiny building blocks of a bigger thing. And it's that bigger thing that's going to have all the value. Because the, the small cameras, let's say I, say I want to buy cameras and I tell the vendor, like today, all the cameras are sold to the phones. They have to work. Every single one of them, 100% have to work. The phone is, varies from 10 bucks to a couple hundred bucks, but they'll go back if the phone doesn't work. Uh, but it would say you go to the vendor and you go, I just want 75% of them to work. Because I'm going to buy a million. I'm going to put a million in this wall, on these walls. And I'm going to do a lot of things with them. And that's a totally different paradigm, different model of how to use cameras. That's coming. So the skills needed to work with camera systems is going to change a lot. They'll count on having these basically free things that are like dust. Any comments on the need or value of compression? Because you're producing oh. a, lo a lot of data. Yeah, compression will be big, really big, for the same reason. So it's what, what kind of image do you want? I mean, do you want image? Maybe you just want yes, no answer. Uh, that's a form of compression. Mm -hmm. Only do my task. Tell me the barcode that came by. Tell me the person who came by. I like, got about 10,000 working together. Who was that? Just tell me that. Uh, and there are also, for medical reasons, that's how it'll drive it first. Uh, so there's a lot of wireless applications that are already going, or very, very low power applications. And so compression will be obligatory. And it'll be very, very low power compression, probably something that's on the order of 25% of the image. Do, do you know that, uh, do you know if the GPX 2000 has been no, so that has IP problems, among other things. So it's like, uh, it's not an open source format. And if we go, actually, let's see here, this BSI picture. So if you were doing things, this is actually a big deal, I didn't talk about this, but so if you had this FSI, let's just say we you build things this way. You start with this and you keep adding layers. This is basically the circuitry, but you can keep going. You can put memory. You could put other circuitry to do other things. You just keep going. But if you're trying to put light through it, it becomes even a crazier physics problem. So people don't. But if you're... If you're going to look from the bottom with, with BSI, then you can keep doing that. And your form factor only changes by the thickness of the circuit, which might be you know, microns. You know, on the mechanical scale, nothing. So this is a big deal in the future. So it doesn't have to get any bigger. It doesn't have to necessarily use more power. But I can get a wireless transmitter. I can get a good compression system on there. 
and it just, this thing would just be longer. Three, four, five more metal layers. It's definitely a big step from where it is today, but it'll go there. Uh, they're, they're actually funny looking depending on the needs of the circuit. They're trying to be square. <laughs> really, it's just, it's, like this, there's just a lot of constraints and a lot of layout issues and uh, they're technically not square but they're very close to square. They'd like them to be square. Any other questions? I hope everybody learned something. So it's kind of an interesting topic and it's not supposed to be a secret. Um, but it's hard to find, hard to just pick up the paper and read about what's the world of cameras doing. But you know, before Kodak would tell everybody what the world of cameras are doing, today almost no one is. Oh, and if I go back to the question, so what's the biggest camera company today? I don't even know. It's, it's really hard to tell. Polaroid was easy to tell. Nokia would say that they're the biggest camera company, but they don't even design or make cameras. They just buy cameras, so that doesn't count. And the supply chains are getting organized, so I think in the next five years you'd be able to point to one and say, who's the biggest camera company? But today, the question almost doesn't mean anything, which is weird. <laughs> hey, let's, thanks.